Hello, and welcome to this edition of Energy Connects Discussions with me, Julian Walker, as I speak to leading energy executives and experts around the world for Energy Connects, our global pa platform for the entire energy industry. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Simon Burbeck, partner at Boston Consulting Group, and Morgan's Home, Associate Director of Boston Consulting Group. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks, Thank you, Julian. In, the, in this edition, I'm really looking forward to discussing what you both see as the road ahead for low carbon fuels. And let's get straight into it. So Simon, I might start with you. Um, how essential will low carbon fuels be going forward in the energy sector? Yeah, well, very essential is the short answer. The long answer is that 90% of the world, if not more, is committed to net zero. Um, that means all sectors, right? Power industry, buildings, mm -hmm. transport, and agriculture, et cetera, would need to decarbonize. And of course, if you look broadly, there's a huge range of possible options to decarbonize, um, but there are challenges in, in many sectors, right? You have intermittency in the power sector, you have process emissions and uh, difficult economics in other sectors like steel, uh, cement, chemicals. Uh, and then you have transport where the low carbon fuels will be particularly uh, interesting. And it's, it's a big sector in terms of emissions, right? It's, it's around 16% of global mm -hmm. emissions. And then the big question is, what are the alternatives to the existing CO2 emitting fossil fuels, right? That's the question. And the problem essentially to answer that is that the existing fossil fuels are really, really good. That's why we use them. Uh, they're a lot cheaper than the alternatives. They are widely accessible and they're easy to transport. Um, and just as an example for, for, for the transport, um, the density of fossil fuels are much better than batteries and also hydrogen. Um, to make an example, one liter of diesel uh, would comprise, or if, if you have a similar level of energy, then for batteries, it would be around 26 liters weighing around 60 kilos. And compressed hydrogen, it would be around seven liters weighing two kilos. Mm -hmm. And by the way, a battery charge is around 500 to 1,000 times slower than this to refuel a, a, a tank on your, on your car, right? Um, so it does have some advantages, and that's why we're using it today. So what are the alternatives? Um, well, if you don't need very long ranges, electrification is great. Uh, it's, yeah. It has much better efficiency than the alternatives because it's better to you know, take renewable power directly into your battery and then to your uh, motor instead of converting it to, let's say, hydrogen or something else and then reconverting it back to, to, um, to power. But when you have long ranges uh, or in planes where weight is an issue, that's where you need other solutions, right? And those solutions are, are low carbon, carbon fuels. It could be in hydrogen, uh, ammonia, methanol, or, or biofuels, or even synthetically um, produced fuels. Um, and you need those in long-haul transportation, you would need them in international shipping, and you would need them in, in aviation. Um, and, and we estimate that, that it's a big market, right? It's 40 to 50 billion US dollars by 2030. Wow. That's our expectation. So in short, yet it, it is very needed in these, in these specific sectors. Yeah, and just quickly, I just want to follow up on that. Um, what also it sounds like is the industry needs to come together, you know, cooperate and to look at what are the other alternatives out there. Yeah, so, so when it comes to that, no doubt, uh, and I think it's more than just the corporations, it's also, I think, one of the key, and I think we, we will have to say it, we need uh, regulatory support and subsidies yeah. to make this happen. So I think that's one of the key elements uh, for this to happen. There's a lot of chicken and the egg going on uh, in many of the, uh, of the projects where we are involved, uh, simply because you may be able to, to secure an offtake, and uh, that means they could be hydrogen or something else. But do you have enough and do is it stable enough that, that you have it, for instance, uh, a, a contract that you can build an asset, an electrolyzer factory or something against? That's the issue uh, right now. That is that those contracts are not really being there. And that's not solving the chicken and the egg. Uh, as of comparison here, like if we took the LNG sector, how that involves, mm -hmm. that's an interesting one actually there because there we see long contracts, 20 years, and you can build against it. And that's the majority of how that works, that business there. And therefore, we were able to develop a, a, that. That character is not here because the technology is still uncertain. Maybe if you're an off-taker, you want to wait a bit because it's cheaper. Uh, maybe you don't know how you're actually going to apply these low-carbon fuels into your fleet. And that's some of the issues we see a lot. That's really interesting. And I also want to just 
follow up with you directly about, you know, the transportation sector does not have, you know, the best track record when it comes to low emissions. And obviously, Simon talked a bit about this, but, you know, in your views, Morgan, you know, how is the transportation sector adapting then to a net zero emission targets in the different areas? Yeah, and I think I will go back to what Simon mentioned, the 16% of emission, yeah. and uh, uh, that is the total part that the transportation uh, uh, is doing on a global scale. And if we then compare, and I think if we look at that uh, also from a historical point of view, the transportation sector have only, when it comes to what we call low carbon fuel, so that's all these low carbon molecules like uh, methanol, uh, hydrogen, and these, has only had a penetration so far of around 4 to 5%. Uh, and the only one who are really from a low carbon point of view have taken a hit or done something as the electricity part of that. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly they're lagging behind, uh, especially on, on this part compared to agriculture, energy and industry and, and waste, for instance, uh, for, for to compare some of the other industries uh, for it. So you can say, what can you do? What are the alternatives uh, when you are in the transportation sector? And just for reference, those 16% that Simon also referred to, you can roughly cut that in and say roughly half of that is passenger transport. Okay. And then you have uh, a quarter, which is roughly commercial vehicles, land transportation, and the rest is shipping and aviation, uh, uh, roughly. So if we take the big okay. cuts of it. So if we look into to what can you do for, for this? So if we just take especially where it is, the electrification have a big success, and that is especially within the um, within the light vehicles, uh, because the efficiency of taking renewable uh, energy power and then just bringing it directly into uh, into the car, and then it hit that you you're not losing a lot of energy. So the efficiency is much higher than first converting renewable power into a molecule and then afterwards putting it into a car and that that's important to understand so therefore mm -hmm. especially the the you can say light vehicle i think when we look at it we are not necessarily thinking that that is a, a area where these low carbon molecules are actually going to win a lot uh, that is mm -hmm. a, an area where if you have the infrastructure, that's the uh, the prerequisite. If you have the power infrastructure, electricity will will yeah. certainly take take demand. However, when you come to more the heavier segments, uh, we can talk land transportation, uh, like uh, class eight vehicles, big trucks, and stuff like that. Here, I think the verdict is still out because electricity. We have to bear in mind that there is four to five times more R and D going into. Uh, basically into electricity than there is into the hydrogen sector. So again, we see new battery technologies also mm. moving into that area. So, so I think years ago, many were saying, yeah, but that's going to be hydrogen and stuff like that. Not sure. I think the verdict is still out uh, for that sector there. But then there are sectors that are more sure. And, and that is the shipping and aviation. It mm -hmm. will take longer time before electricity will have a, a view there. So it's simply from its, its pure physics, it's too difficult <laughs> from, uh, from density and a lot of stuff uh, to, to actually do it. So here uh, the key is, and that's where we certainly see it uh, going in. And you can say, I think it's important to understand that, that one thing is the low carbon fuel, but there's a lot of elements that goes into it. So if you are, Looking into to shipping, you can say uh, you can either use biofuels, mm -hmm. you can use uh, these type of what we call power to liquids or power to X, these type of liquid fuels, uh, where we use renewable energy to produce uh, a hydrocarbon, or there's some kind of electrification. And we just talked about how electrification especially work for the lighter vehicles, but as you go heavier, it becomes more difficult. We also have to bear in mind that historically what have driven it is certainly the transportation efficiency, like with our houses and everything else. We actually have done a lot, in, especially in Europe, on efficiency. And that is still a very important uh, lever that people tend to forget. And then, of course, there's one uh, lever more. We just haven't seen that in the transportation sector. We've seen that in other sectors. That is, you reduce the amount of transportation. So there's also a volume thing in, into it. Uh, whether that's going to happen in transportation, it's going to be interesting because that, that is linked to the globalization, so to speak. So if you look into these types of, of fuels, then say, okay, how are that adapting uh, uh, for this one? So what we see is that many companies now are saying, okay, first of all, and that's the type of things that Simon and I are working with for, mm -hmm. for, for different clients is 
basically they are asking the first thing they ask is okay how does this impact me this hydrogen can you help us uh, try to to find out uh, is this a threat or is this a gift uh, and then it comes after that say okay how can i then oh that's a good thing let's try to basically find out how do we then play uh, into yeah. this value chain and where do we play how do we play who do we partner with and then as we go along and that's where we involved more and more that is okay we also have to build the production assets we might have to build uh, many of these elements that actually enables it and that's where we are today uh, for it what we see is again and back to what i mentioned before the the whole offtake uh, part we see people testing it out to learn and then by learning where they also find out is there a certain position in the value chain it could be uh, storage uh, mm -hmm. of uh, ammonia on a on a harbor or something that is going to be a choke point going forward so if i have that one do i then have value can i basically create value out of that and those are the elements that you can see many are, are basically uh, testing out now and figuring out uh, and then decarbonizing a part of their fleet and then when they like pilot scales and then at some point when they have they feel comfortable about it that they can operate it then we will see these bigger scales but we probably have to see those bigger scales uh, not not for the next five years but after that we will start that really being exponential yeah yeah so you see yeah, sort of you said the people piloting and uh I, I think that was interesting that where you're saying that how boston Sultan group is getting more involved with you know, questions of clients and so i'd like to get you here of you know what are the tactics do you think you know market producers are taking or looking to take or asking what they should be taking so I would say in the broader context, of course, the first thing producers should consider is what are their own decarbonization pathway, right? Mm -hmm. So that's more an internal thing, right? That is related to the overall question, what are we doing to, to address the, the, the energy transition uh, topic, right? But more specifically for low carbon fuels, um, I would say, of course, one and all companies should consider what their strategy are, right? But once that is then decided and they would want to pursue, then there are some things that are quite important, right? So mm -hmm. and also seeing different companies are doing, essentially securing access uh, to the resources, I would say, is, is something that given that the market inevitably would develop down the line, that we see quite a rush to across the globe and also here in the Middle East where I'm based, uh, that companies are essentially looking for what are the best places to produce low carbon uh, fuels um, hydrogen uh, could be with renewables, which is very much is here in, in the Middle East, but it's also the combination of natural gas and then carbon sequestration reserves, right? So essentially making sure that you are well positioned in terms of access to feedstock down the line as yeah. this market really picks up, right? Um, of course, again, speaking from a, a Middle Eastern perspective, there's super strong fundamentals for this here, right? We have the renewable resource, the strong sun and some wind somewhere, we have the land access, available gas feedstock and sequestration capacity, and also the, the expertise. And that's why we also see many companies, both local companies across the countries here, but also uh, international companies coming to the Middle East and essentially looking for one, piloting projects, also building up projects at scale, especially when it comes to hydrogen. Most of those are mined for exports right now because mm -hmm. the relation and customer push tend to be uh, stronger in, in, let's say, Europe, also in, in, in East Asia, right? So they're focusing on, on exports um, of primarily hydrogen, also ammonia. But what I would expect to see down the line is that these companies then increasingly, as the markets are developing both internationally, but also here in the Middle East, yep. and so broaden out the portfolio of different types of, of fuels that are required, right, to, to, to essentially mm -hmm deliver the gamut of low carbon hydrogen all the way to, let's say, e-kerosene that would eventually be needed across the globe uh, for, for aviation. Super. Um, that's really interesting. And Moses, I want to go back and, you know, we, we touched briefly on, you know, regulation, but I think some of your answers as well, I want to sort of see what your thoughts on, you know, con consumer choice as well. And, you know, what are the key factors in helping build a low carbon future? Because I think you're obviously need the government involvement, but also, as you were saying, you know, maybe the choice of not using transportation, but that could come down to consumer choice. Yeah, no doubt. But if we start to say, okay, what do we see 
today that are some of the uh, the point and the struggles we see from the basically the front line of this. Yeah. And I think one one thing is we have there's a lot of discussion in the media all the time around production of hydrogen. The issue is not is is less that the issue is actually transportation of hydrogen uh, mm-hmm. for it, because in many cases that is much more expensive than the production. So therefore, we need to build a transportation infrastructure. Uh, that's one of the key elements there. And mm-hmm. if we take that as a as a case, you can say this is where certainly uh, the uh, government and regulation and policy makers can make a difference uh, if they want to enable this. That is that yeah. the basic infrastructure, uh, for instance, pipeline building uh, is done, power grid uh, is done, repurpose of gas pipelines uh, for that. Uh, that's you can say that's that's basically helping getting those assets and accelerating that asset development, and then there's also investing in and and funding and helping de-risking uh, technologies that can enable cheaper transport. Here there is, for instance, uh, ammonia cracking. So we basically crack the ammonia back to to the original and therefore hydrogen. Uh, it could also be be other types of uh, hydrogen carriers that enables that suddenly we actually can carry cheaply energy. Now, again, as a reference back to the LNG uh, sector, the building that LNG fleet and making that, you can say, cost effectively. So when you are getting LNG, it was not about the transportation cost, but it was about where the production cost is. That took decades. We cannot wait for that. No. So th- this is the key task for the government that is to help on that infrastructure. And it is, unfortunately, especially there are some some good things here. That is, building the infrastructure to carry, for instance, hydrogen is actually relatively cheap. As an example, the uh, backbone, hydrogen backbone that is currently being considered in uh, in uh, in Europe, for instance, is yeah, depending again on prices, but uh, roughly hundred billion if you want to build that. Now, just upgrading the power infrastructure going towards net zero in Germany is double of that. So we have to bear in mind that transporting and making the whole power grid work might be very expensive. So there's certainly some good things. You need to do both, but there are certainly some, a big bang for the buck also on being able to do that infrastructure. And that is what can, for instance, get uh, especially the Middle East on the map because they can do all the cheap hydrogen they want if they cannot land it cheaply. It won't make a sense. Uh, so therefore, these are some of the key elements uh, there. And this is where government really have responsibility uh, to, to do one thing. And then I think on customer choice, that's some of the things mm-hmm. I mentioned before. You need to test it out on your own fleet. You need to uh, leverage uh, uh, that you then do some early investments. And also thinking not just in access, for instance, to renewables. That That's going to be one of the key challenges. A good example is... Um, is for instance in uh, Europe, it was actually put in, not in legislation, but suggested legislation by Euro- European Commission uh, yesterday, uh, where it's looking into that we will uh, do renewable hydrogen 10 million ton per yeah. annum in 2030, and also actually import to be renewable hydrogen 10 million ton per annum with a requirement that that renewable that are used to there is not gonna cannibalize the electrification of our societies. Because the electrification, and that's back to that efficiency I mentioned earlier, is very important uh, because it's the electrification of a society that is the key uh, because that's the fundamental thing. And then the second part is doing all these low carbon uh, molecules if you want to go to net zero. So, so that puts a requirement because then you need to make power, you make a lot of renewables to do the electrification of a society. And then on top of that, you have to make all the, the renewables you need for, for instance, uh, power to X. So that's, for instance, for these low carbon mm-hmm. molecules. You need power also if you want to do direct air capture. That's one of the critical elements here. So there's a lot of things where we need a lot of power. And that's going to be one of the issues also. How can we build and scale that fast enough? Uh, and that's why we see uh, governments, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark and Germany went together and said, we're going to build 150 gigawatt. as a lot. in uh, in uh, the North Sea. Yeah. Actually, from a P2X point of view, that's not necessarily a big number. So that tells you a bit about uh, some of the issues there is uh, there. S- certainly. And I think I just, you know, just before we end, I think a lot also is, you know, geopolitics is, is back on 
back on the map um, and obviously forcing, you know, different regions, but obviously Europe, you know, the UK, you know, their energy security going forward and what it looks like. And obviously low carbon fuels is going to play a major part of it. Yes. Uh, certainly, certainly. And, and you could say interesting part is also then if we look, so that's, that's Europe. And if we then look in many other countries, uh, then again, uh, China, uh, if you look at that, the decarbonizing there is, is that their access to renewables and gas is actually an issue. So uh, how are they going to scale up? Have they even roughly probably started that? I wouldn't say. Uh, even on the renewable part of that. So that's one of the issues that are there. Are there alternatives? Yeah, nuclear power and, and using that is certainly an alternative, for instance, in some of these countries. Uh, yeah. so, so interesting to see how that innovation goes on, especially in Asia uh, for it. Uh, in US, again, we have high availability of gas. Uh, yeah. And no doubt you can also efficiently decarbonize gas. And that is also uh, certainly also a pragmatic way and a cheaper way in many cases to uh, to to the paradigm that we have in Europe. Maybe, maybe adding adding yes. adding one to that, Julian, if I may. Um, I think in in theory, of course, it is a nice thought to have um, synthetic fuels produced by renewables because you can place the renewables wherever, right? And therefore, you can you can be less dependent on long supply chains, right? So. Uh, that is certainly one, I would say, driver behind uh, the, the current developments we're seeing. But mm -hmm. I think it's important to take into consideration, as, as Mons also mentioned, that in order to decarbonize, especially sort of fairly densely populated areas like Europe, you need so much renewables, right? You need renewables across pretty much all sectors, right? Yeah. And, and low carbon fuels takes a lot of power. And therefore, it is likely not sufficient with the uh, renewable power that can be produced in Europe to serve Europe's need. And that's why Europe would still need to import fuels. Now, hopefully over long term, that shift will then be from fossil fuels right, to uh, low carbon fuels, uh, where there's a number of different uh, candidates for where that should, should come from. Yeah, no, really interesting. And look, Simon Mong, I appreciate you making the time today to speak to me and sharing your really interesting insights and views on where the road is going for low carbon fuels and a lot to still do and as you said pilot and testing um to then go into the big mainstream um lot to look out for um and uh yeah very interesting to get your insights thanks a lot thanks julian thank you thanks everyone for watching and i look forward to bringing you more engaging discussions soon <laughs>